Welcome to the American Society of ECHO E3 Lecture Series. My name is Lucy Safi and I am Director of Interventional Echocardiography at Hackensack University Medical Center and Chair of the ASC Emerging Echo Enthusiasts, also known as E3 Special Interest Group. This special interest group provides an opportunity for early career physicians, sonographers, and trainees who are interested in echocardiography to present, interact, and discuss echocardiographic topics. Each lecture is formatted as a 30-minute didactic lecture followed by a panel discussion. On the panel will be two moderators and an expert in the field. During the discussion section, the panelists will also answer audience questions, so please enter your questions in the Q&A box below. This virtual lecture series will be recorded and later available online via the ASC E3 website. To join ASC E3 Special Interest Group, log into your ASC account and under Update My Profile, click Specialty Interest Groups and then E3. Today's lecture is the final lecture in the Structural Heart mini-series on the topic of tricuspid valve interventions. Joining me today is Dr. Enrique garcia Sayon. Dr. garcia Sayon is an Associate Professor at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center at Houston. He is Cardiology and Echocardiography Lab Director at the Lyndon B. Johnson Hospital and a Structural and Interventional Echocardiographer at Memorial Hermann Hospital. He is a fellow of the American Society of Echocardiography, where he serves on several committees and task forces. He is also a graduate of the inaugural ASC Leadership Academy class. Welcome, Dr. garcia Sayon, and thank you for joining me today. Thank you for the invitation. Our physician expert is Dr. Burkhard McKenson. Dr. McKenson is professor and interim chair of the Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine at the University of Washington in Seattle. Dr. McKenson also serves as Director of Interventional Echocardiography at the, D at the UW Medicine Heart Institute and is practicing cardiothoracic anesthesiologist and critical care physician. He is a member of the Board of Directors for the ASC, co-chair of the ASC's Industry Roundtable Committee, chair of the Council of Perioperative Echocardiography, and a leadership member in the Interventional Echocardiography Specialty Interest Group. In his spare time, Dr. McKenson lectures both nationally and internationally on the role of 2D and 3D TEE in lectures both nationally and internationally. Welcome, Dr. McKenson. Thank you so much for being our expert panelist today. Happy to be here. Thank you. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Deepa Raghunathan. Dr. Raghunathan graduated medical school at Texas A&M College of Medicine, internal medicine residency at University of Alabama in Birmingham, and general cardiology fellowship at the University of Texas in Houston. She currently works at the UT in Houston with a focus on structural heart imaging. Welcome, Dr. Raghunathan. We look forward for your presentation. This is a very timely topic. Um, it is commonly quoted that there's more than 1.6 million Americans with tricuspid regurgitation, but a very small percentage actually undergo surgical interventions. Um, and it's overall, the tricuspid valve has just been an undervalued valve until recently. So you can see here that on its own, tricuspid the presence of tric tricuspid regurgitation is associated with worse outcomes. And prognosis is worse with more severe tricuspid regurgitation. There's now even new data showing that isolated TR when adjusted for common confounders such as left-sided heart disease, RV dysfunction, or pulmonary hypertension still impacts mortality in a negative way. Standard treatment for TR is medical therapy with diuretics or surgical interventions. However, surgery for concomitant left and right-sided disease uh, remains low, um, mainly because these are very high surgical risk patients. Um, in addition, even surgery for isolated TR is associated with uh, poor in-hospital outcomes uh, when compared with single valve uh, surgical interventions. So because of the growing need to address the tricuspid valve, there's been an emergence of percutaneous approaches to treat the TR. So today I wanted to go over the anatomy of the tricuspid valve and the different ideologies of TR, as well as the echocardiographic assessment um, with the primary focus on the structural views and then, of course, the devices themselves. 
So you'd think that the tricuspid valve only has three leaflets, the anterior leaflet, which is by the uh, aortic valve, the septal leaflet uh, by the intraventricular septum, and the posterior leaflet, uh, which is by the RV free wall. However, that configuration is only seen in about 50% of patients in uh, this particular study. Instead, we can have two leaflets. Uh, more commonly, we have four leaflets. Um, and the second most common type of morphology is where we have two posterior leaflets with an anterior and septal leaflet. And then there have been five or six leaflets reported as well. So a thorough assessment of the number of leaflets um, is, is important. We can't just assume that it's just gonna be three leaflets. A little bit more on the ideology of TR, uh, the most common cause of tricuspid regurgitation is secondary TR. And it's usually due to uh, left-sided disease, whether it's uh, mitral or aortic valvulopathy or left, uh, or left ventricular systolic dysfunction. Less than 10% of the time, um, TR is uh, due to a primary ideology, but it's still most commonly due to uh, cardiac implantable devices. So going back to secondary TR, there's uh, two uh, types of secondary TR. The most common is ventricular functional tricuspid regurgitation. And that's when you have this marked right ventricular enlargement and dilatation. So you have this elongation of the right ventricle, which ultimately causes tethering of the leaflets themselves. And you get this leaflet tenting that you can see here. Um, and that is what causes the loss of coaptation and is an important point to note uh, when we're doing uh, certain uh, edge to edge repairs. Um, notably uh, ventricular function, uh, functional TR has worse outcomes compared to the second type of TR, which is our atrial functional TR. Not as common, but this is where your atria are so dilated that it's um, causing annular dilatation. Um, since the ventricle itself isn't necessarily getting elongated, uh, the leaflets are not tented. Instead, you actually have minimal tenting and essentially a flattening of the leaflets, and that's what's causing the malcoptation there. Um, and atrial functional is commonly associated with advanced age as well as, as well as atrial fibrillation. So the annulus plays an important role in secondary TR. Uh, normally, the annulus itself is an elliptical shape with the posterior septal portion on the ventricular aspect, while the anterior septal portion is more atrial. But unlike the mitral valve annulus, the tricuspid annulus is difficult to define because it's less fibrous. So because it's less fibrous, um, we can see significant annular dilatation. And that uh, dilatation is in the direction of the posterior and lateral wall. Um, causing the annulus to, instead of becoming elliptical, it becomes more flat and more planar. Um, dilatation is kind of limited at the septal portion, mainly because of its close proximity to the fibrous skeleton of the heart. So we mainly see this outward, outward um, direction of annular dilatation. And because of this uh, flexibility, so to speak, of the annulus, um, it varies significantly with loading conditions, which can play an, a significant role intraprocedurally. So then I wanted to talk about these chordal structures as well, because they are um, very varied in attachment uh, compared to the mitral side. So there's usually a large anterior and posterior papillary muscle, but they give off many an unpredictable number of second and third order chordae tendinae, um, which can uh, be particularly challenging with our edge to edge repairs as they can interact with the device. So as you can see, there's a lot of components of the tricuspid valve there. Um, and therefore, we need to perform a comprehensive echo assessment to assess the entire tricuspid annulus, um, uh, the entire tricuspid apparatus uh, prior to um, performing transcatheter interventions. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about the echocardiographic views next. Uh, the entire tricuspid valve cannot be visualized fully by a 2D echo um, by transthoracic um, or cannot be visualized fully by transthoracic echo and it requires several views. Um, though the valve itself is a more anterior structure and we can visualize it by transthoracic, it really depends on your angulation and location of the probe to identify certain landmarks uh, so that you can um, identify the leaflet themselves. So in this particular view, for instance, we have the peristernal RV inflow view, um, and consistent, consistently on the right side, you will be able to see the anterior leaflet, but the uh, second leaflet um, is very dependent on your angulation. Um, if you're pointing more towards the coronary sinus, which is the arrow here, um, you're probably going to be seeing more of the septal leaflet, and if you're pointing away more posteriorly, you're uh, going to be seeing more of the posterior leaflet. Uh, the peristernal short axis view is also very varied in terms of the leaflets that you're going to be seeing. If you uh, are 
actually more at the LVOT level, you're probably going to be seeing more of the septal leaflet. Um, whereas uh, if you see the aortic valve, you're either going to be seeing all of the anterior leaflet or you can potentially see the posterior leaflet. And finally, with the apical four-chamber view, uh, since we're seeing the interventricular septum, we're going to likely be seeing the septal leaflet. But again, uh, what that second leaflet is, is very dependent on your angulation. It could be the anterior or the posterior leaflet, depending on how you're cutting the valve. So that was more of a, almost like a textbook uh, example of what we should be seeing uh, with the what leaflets we should be seeing on these different views, but obviously it's very different from patient to patient. Um, with um, this can be kind of uh, assisted by using a 3D rendering of the tricuspid valve. So in this um, by transthoracic, and, and to do this, the patient would be in a steep left lateral decubitus position with the transducer probe essentially vertical. And usually you try to get the RV inflow view, but any view that where you can see the tricuspid valve uh, clearly is great. And what you're gonna do is um, you're gonna um, change your region of interest so that it's small enough to maximize your temporal resolution, but still large enough to get the entire annulus. And then with additional cropping and techniques, you can get a 3D view of the uh, tricuspid valve. And here's an example from Marara et al. that uh, shows very clearly uh, the entire tricuspid um, apparatus by transthoracic. So unlike uh, TTE, a uh, transesophageal echo of the uh, tricuspid valve can be very challenging. Um, because it is an anterior structure, it is the furthest away from the esophagus. Uh, the leaflets themselves are thinner than compared to the mitral valve, and the annulus is not on FOSS with the transducer. And those are all points that will become relevant as we talk more about the uh, devices themselves. So to provide a comprehensive tricuspid valve assessment, there are going to be these new ASC TEE guidelines, which are still in the pre-proof stage, but special shout out to uh, Dr. Safi and Mackinson who are on this webinar right now, who are involved in creating these guidelines, and we're really looking forward uh, to reading them um, and uh, you know, providing a comprehensive assessment of our tricuspid valve. So there are four primary views to assess the tricuspid valve, uh, but I really wanted to focus on two of them. Uh, the first being the RV inflow and outflow view. Um, this is where your uh, transducer omniplane angle is about 60 to 80 degrees, and you're cutting across the anterior and posterior leaflet and essentially parallel to the septal leaflet. So when you um, turn on your uh, X plane or biplane, um, you will be cutting across the, uh, the septal leaflet no matter what. Um, no matter uh, where you're uh, moving your X-plane. Um, so if you're at the anterior leaflet, you're likely going to be seeing the anterior and septal leaflet. And then if you're at the move it towards the posterior leaflet, you're going to be seeing the septal and posterior leaflet. And this is our grasping view um, on our edge-to-edge -edge repair. So this is a very uh, key view um, for, for our procedures. Another essential view I wanted to talk about is our gastric view. Uh, this is where uh, with 2D, we can assess the entire um, tricuspid valve um, apparatus. Um, we can see, and this can usually be obtained at 30 to 50 degree um, transducer or uh, omniplane angle. And again, you can see the number of leaflets, the chordal insertion sites, and the location of the worst regurgitant jet. And that's where you can target your therapies. So, how do we grade tricuspid regurgitation? So ASC has mild, moderate, severe uh, classifications, and they're based off of qualitative and quantitative uh, parameters. Uh, but with more recent structural interventions, the severity of TR seen, especially in our early feasibility trials, just was not fully appreciated. So here is a recommended grading scheme by Dr. Rebecca Hahn to define more severe TR. Um, it includes uh, massive and torrential classifications. It also includes um, the biplane vena contracta width, which is basically uh, two uh, vena contractas um, width uh, that were obtained uh, from two orthogonal angles as well as the 3D vena contracta area. And now we have additional studies that show that there is an improvement um, of more severe TR. So if you go from torrential to severe TR, there is improved outcomes. So what do we do for these patients currently? 
So our current American guidelines is essentially surgery is gold standard for tricuspid valve interventions. Uh, but the only class one indication for uh, tricuspid valve surgery is severe symptomatic TR at the time of left-sided surgery. And overall, that's been underutilized for many years. And now with the advent of transcatheter uh, treatments for um, our aortic and mitral valves, our tricuspid valves have, again, gone to the wayside. Um, so we, we are now, um, again, seeing more of a need for percutaneous options to fix the tricuspid valve. But in addition, um, over a 10-year period, isolated uh, uh, tricuspid valve operations um, have been very limited. There's only been about 5,000 um, uh, nationally over a 10-year period, which isn't much at all. So even though there's been a rise in the number of replacement and repairs of the tricuspid valve, the in-house mortality, in-hospital mortality, is about 8.8%. Uh, and if it's not death, then they have significant uh, morbidity post-procedure. So there's a clear lack of enthusiasm for surgically operating on the uh, tricuspid valve. So because of that, um, and because of the need that needs to be addressed, um, you can see that really over the last five to 10 years, um, there's been several percutaneous options that have been developed and are undergoing trials. Um, and it's, it's really, um, it's a fast and growing field. So to talk more about the device landscape of uh, tricuspid valve repair, um, we have four main categories. Uh, one is the coaptation devices, and this includes your edge-to-edge -edge repair uh, devices with uh, the triclip and the um, Pascal devices. It also includes a spacer device, which is essentially a uh, foam cylinder that's sitting at the, um, or it's at the level of the coaptation uh, uh, not coaptation, and it's fixed to the right ventricle, kind of like a pacemaker, and it's just passively reducing the effect of regurgitant orifice area. Um, we also have two other, or we have um, annuloplasty modification devices, and that includes the tri-align and the cardio band. Uh, we have these cable valve implants, which are actually not being uh, implanted or interacting with the tricuspid valve itself. They're actually being implanted in the vena cava. And then, of course, we have our transcatheter uh, tricuspid valve replacements. So I'm going to talk about uh, each of these in a little bit more detail. So first with the coaptation devices, and specifically with edge-to-edge -edge repair, because that's the one that's most commonly used, um, we have the Abbott triclip as well as the Edward Edwards Pascal device. Um, there are um, both edge-to-edge -edge repair devices where you're grabbing two leaflets and bringing them together. Um, both of these have received a CE mark in Europe and are undergoing currently undergoing pivotal trials here in the US. Um, unlike the mitral valve, um, tricuspid, or unlike the mitral valve edge edge repair, where you can sometimes get, a, get away with just using 2D imaging, uh, with tricuspid and just the annulus and the limitations I've mentioned before about transesophageal imaging of the tricuspid valve, you know, using live 3D multiplanar reconstruction can play a crucial role in guiding these devices and confirming le leaflet grasp, um, which is what you can see in this view. Here's our gastric view, um, and you can see um, where our device is, um, and we can guide where we need to move the device. Um, but simultaneously, we can also get the grasping view as well, and you can see the class coming down, and you can confirm that you really do have good leaflet grasp. A little bit more about the uh, uh, measurements and um, uh, potential uh, issues with these devices. Uh, the coaptation gap is a very important parameter. Um, we are seeing that if it's more than seven millimeters, it makes uh, device attachment and leaflet apposition very challenging. And also, we have to, if there's a lot of portal inner portal structures or calcifications in the grasping area, as well as any interaction with any um, pacemaker ICD leads, um, can make edge to edge uh, repair challenging or if not prohibitive. So uh, next, uh, I want to talk about some early data from these, uh, some of these early feasibility trials uh, from the Triluminate, which is using the Abbott Triclip, and then the uh, Class TR trial, which is using the Edwards Pascal device. And in both of these, uh, there's a significant and sustained reduction in tricuspid regurgitation. Um, in addition, there's also associated improvement in NYHA class, as well as quality of life that's seen at one year in the triluminate and 30 days in the class TR um, study. So that is very um, promising results. So next I wanna talk about the transcatheter uh, 
uh, valve replacements. And there are many um, that are undergoing early feasibility trials, but only one, the EVOC, is um, undergoing a clinical pivotal trial, clinical, uh, clinical pivotal trials here in the US. And so potential patients who could benefit from uh, this particular valve replacement uh, could be those who were excluded uh, from edge-to-edge -edge repair. Um, but one thing to consider, uh, particularly with uh, this uh, valve replacement, is your patient selection. So um, essentially with this valve replacement, you are trying to uh, completely get rid of the tri uh, tricuspid regurgitation. And so you have to consider the acute afterload mismatch that could cause worsened RV uh, dysfunction and failure. So challenges with this device is, again, if you start off with severe RV dysfunction, it might make that worse. And also the annular dilatation. So remember the annulus is um, can vary with loading conditions and sometimes can be very large for this device. So it can make procedural planning and implantation quite a challenge. And the other thing is um, most of these patients usually have some sort of congestive hepatopathy or cardiac cirrhosis that has caused um, coagulopathies and uh, these will uh, at this time require any coagulation. So if they're not able to tolerate any coagulation, uh, this valve wouldn't be, uh, or this um, device wouldn't be an option. So our third type is our um, tricuspid annular repair. Uh, we, the first uh, annuloplasty device that was implanted was the trialine, uh, which implants two pledgets along the posterior leaflet and then cinches them together, which essentially causes bicuspidization of the valve by obliterating the posterior leaflet. And this was uh, first studied in the scalp trial. And then uh, the cardio band um, is uh, actually the one that has received a CE mark in Europe. And what that does is it's implanting this incomplete ring and it uses these screw-like anchors um, along the annulus. And then the device itself is cinched together and adjusted uh, interprocedurally for TR reduction. Um, but uh, there are several challenges with uh, annular opacity repair. Uh, one being that, again, since the annulus is not as fibrous, there's less support for these anchors. Um, and also the imaging and interprocedural, the pre-procedural and interprocedural imaging can be very challenging. So it can be very hard to tell exactly where you're um, implanting your anchors, um, which is a key part of this uh, particular device implantation. So next we have the cable devices, and these are devices that are actually implanted into the IVC and sometimes the SVC to reduce the reflux scene uh, beyond the right atrium. And as of uh, May of 2021, we have the trike valve that has received a CE mark in Europe. And these are self-expandable devices that are implanted in both the SVC and IVC. So early data shows that as expected, uh, there's no reduction or change in tricuspid regurgitation, but there has been some improvement in quality of life. So a little summary of these devices. Um, as you can see, there's many devices out there that are currently undergoing early feasibility or phase three pivotal clinical trials. Uh, four of them have been um, uh, have received the CE mark in Europe, but none as of now have uh, gotten FDA approval here in the US. Um, some of the challenges with the edge to edge repair, as mentioned before, is the tethering um, of the leaflets or if there's a very large gap. Um, with uh, the valve replacements, it's either with the RV annulus, the, um, or I'm sorry, the large uh, tricuspid valve annulus or RV dysfunction, as well as an intolerance with anticoagulation. And again, with the uh, difficulty with imaging and procedural planning um, of annual plastic devices, uh, we're still, um, there's still a role for it. Uh, we're just trying to figure out the, the best patients that would uh, benefit the most from it. So, Given the number of different devices and different stages of trials, the trivalve registry has been created to evaluate the initial clinical applications of valve implantations of various devices. So, so far there are 312 patients um, in this registry who have severe TR who underwent um, any sort of device implantation, and the most common being the triclip or the mitriclip. But you can see all of our, our all of the different um, device uh, types have been included in this uh, registry. Um, procedural success was defined as successful implantation of the device, as well as a reduction of TR to less than two plus or moderate, and that was seen in seventy three percent of patients. And um, the predictors of procedural failure, again, as mentioned, is if you have significant uh, coaptation depth or, depth or um, annular uh, dilatation. And we can see here um, that the outcomes after these valve uh, repair 
overall, the survival benefit is better than if uh, than our control, those who had significant TR. And then also those who had procedural failure, those who ended up with um, uh, unchanged or not as improved uh, TR also had similar outcomes as those as the control um, as as the control arm as well. So these valve implantations um, and interventions are um, showing, at least in the short term, some benefit. And so I wanted to go back and touch about the timing of these procedures. So surgical interventions, as I've mentioned, are associated with the worst outcomes. But in the study, they found that it's really like NYHA class and RV dysfunction that were more likely to be predictors of mortality and morbidity rather than the ideology of the tricuspid regurgitation. So this suggests that maybe we're identifying these patients too late and sending them for interventions when they're already too far along in their disease process. So I think with more experience um, in the realm of tricuspid valve disease, we'll have a better idea of which patients um, are gonna benefit the most uh, from tricuspid valve interventions, as well as uh, what device could be used to not only reduce their TR severity, but also improve uh, their mortality and quality of life. So with that, um, I thank you all for your time and attention, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you so Thanks. much, Deepa. That was excellent and very detailed. Um, so many great talking points to really elaborate on. And um, I wanted to ask our expert the first question, if you don't mind, and, and wanted to remind the audience that if you do have any questions, please enter it in the Q&A box below and we will answer them. Um, the tricuspid valve is a very challenging valve to image uh, because oftentimes we do find a lot of artifacts, specifically shadow artifact from, um, you know, angling or, or possibly other prosthetic valves inside the heart. Uh, so Burkhard, what is your advice in terms of optimizing imaging for the tricuspid valve? What are some tips and tricks you can you can give us in order to get better images of the tricuspid valve. Yeah, thank you for that. And uh, first off, uh, thanks for this excellent overview and uh, presentation, Deepa. That was uh, very thorough and comprehensive and delivered on short uh, notice, short time. Um, I would say the following. It starts with an intent to want to image. And I cannot overemphasize that. What I mean with that is, for instance, the imager really would want to be there. And the imager really would want to work closely with the interventional cardiologist or uh, the team that's on the other side, so to speak, so that there is communication and that there's an intent to improve the image. I'm of the, I'm convinced that anytime I'm imaging, there's something little that I can do to improve the image. And uh, I cannot overemphasize enough how much that means. That means just a subtle movement. That means having your hand, at least at times, really on the probe where it enters the patient's mouth so that you have control. And we have to think about imaging as a challenge as it is for transthoracic imaging or any other ultrasound. You need to have a good contact with the tissue that you're trying to image. And the same here, there may be, um, there may be a hernia. There may be a configuration that brings the esophagus away from the heart or the heart is rotated because of the right side that's so big. All of these present challenges and we can only overcome if we really have an intent to make minute, uh, but at times challenging and key movements in order to improve that contact. Uh, the next point I would make is uh, don't give up if you have a uh, lack of one imaging plane that you're always counting on. I think in this uh, day and age, the the huge advantage of our new TE probes and machines is that we have the ability of 3D imaging and therefore we have multiplanar imaging, which is a result of basically being able to obtain any view from anywhere along the esophagus. So if you, if you really have your best window in the transgastric and Deepa showed one slide that really illustrate, illustrated the multiplanar um, ability where you have for instance, a cross section where you start on the left with a posterior leaflet, then you have an anterior leaflet, you have the aortic valve as a landmark and you know an anatomic landmark. So you know your anterior posterior, and then you know your biplane image or your multiplane image on the right 
is then going to be always septal and then a more lateral aspect, which often is the, the anterior leaflet. And then you have a good grasping view right there. I don't care if you get that image, that initial 3D from the deep transgastric or transgastric point of view, but uh, you have to get it somewhere uh, in order to, to show and, and have um, some resolution that, that convinces us that we can actually produce a grasp. Now, I, I saw the um, question by um, Dr. Bellani there, which is an excellent point, which really talks about uh, the challenges that we have with imaging at times with side lobe artifacts. I would throw in there the question of reverberations from prosthetic valves that may be in the mitral aortic position. And when you have those challenges, it's not for the faint of heart. You have to really have an intent. You want to overcome the challenges. And again, it is trying something different and not giving up. Um, often we find that there's alternative modes. At times to go as far as to say, well, let's look at the trump thoracic imaging that was done on a given patient. And perhaps there is a window from transthoracic that we can use for just the grasp. And then maybe once the grasp has been accomplished, we can assess the severity of TR following the grasp and closing of a clip or a clasp device. We can then assess the TR with TE again and kind of go back and forth. Just to think of around the topic, what do I have in my tool set, so to speak, uh, to, to overcome the, the difficulty? Uh, and Still, I would add that there are cases where, yes, it's really challenging to the point that you may have to conclude this patient is not suitable because you can't see enough in order to ensure a safe deployment of a device in a, in a leaflet. And, and you just have to acknowledge that. And we've certainly seen those scenarios. Ideally, they're being picked up ahead of time, meaning they're being picked up in the screening that's where that guideline document is going to be really helpful to have a all-encompassing approach to to know what to look for agnostic of any device uh, the, the guideline paper has about 150 pages there's no device in there so it's it's all inclusive it, it's just about the heart and it's just about imaging but again it's small little tricks and tips that I, I'm, I'm hoping I'm, I'm getting across here Burkhard, those are uh, fantastic uh, tips for the audience indeed. I have a follow-up question about the transgastric view specifically. Um, Deepa showed, showed some really good pictures. Obviously, it is a key view for uh, uh, evaluation of the structure of the valve and also looking at the, uh, the clip arm orientation in regards to the valve. But how often do you use that valve for actual grasp? Or, and, and in particular, what would you typically use for grasping view? Yeah, excellent point. And there are actually some interventional cardiologists and, and imagers that select that particular view, the transgastric short axis view. And Deepa said it right, it's somewhere between 30 and 50 degree on the multiplane angle. So you'll have to have a little bit of an angle assess, uh, adjustment in order to get a good short axis. Uh, some, some really choose that as their grasping view. Um, a good example is someone who's probably implanted uh, about the most uh, tricuspid clips in the world. That's uh, Dr. von Bardusleben in Mainz. And he uh, showed some, some examples during a prior TCT meeting where he's really looking for the perpendicularity of the clip arms in reference to the free edge of the leaflets. And he's convinced he gets that in an unforeshortened, unbiased view without any parallax issue or issues of looking at it oblique. If you, if you imagine you're using just a 3D image, you may be uh, looking at it from an oblique point of view and then you get, yes, what we call a parallax error. That's where, again, the multi-view or biplane imaging is key. You can align things so that they make sense to you and the interventional cardiologist. Uh, the key is to have a clear understanding what you're looking at. So be consistent in your imaging there as well. Um, so if you're, com if you're comfortable and if you have a good transgastric view, uh, then I would encourage you and your team to explore that option. We've certainly uh, gone there and have done that. 
and um, still teaching my interventional cardiologist uh, how to pronounce the last name for, for Dr. von Bardesleben, but we're working on that one. It's a very important view to take pictures from, I believe, the transgastric view, because like you said, if, if you don't have a great 3D um, esophageal view, at least you know that you're lined up appropriately. And also, again, going back to Deepa's wonderful presentation in valves that have multiple leaflets, you know, when you have four leaflets, for example, on that tricuspid valve, at least it gives you at least a ballpark idea of where you are with the edge to edge clip. Um, wanted to ask, um, how, how do you measure um, the coaptation gap? Uh, do you routinely use 3D um, MPR to do that? Do you do it on 2D? What is, what is your advice for measuring the coaptation gap? Yes. Before I get there, I just want to add one comment to Dr. Birani there, um, who, who asked about uh, side lobe artifacts as well. And I see that again uh, with maybe one device more than the other. And uh, I, I use every opportunity I have when I talk with device manufacturers and echo uh, machine manufacturers and, and you know when they talk to each other, that they need to be mindful and think of us in the imaging space to be thinking of the materials that they use. And um, the, the best tip I would have there, um, Kiran, is really at times just a slight little lifting of your probe, kind of pulling it out a little bit out of the patient and maybe changing your angle slightly. All of a sudden, you may have an, a more oblique cut that brings you maybe one side of the leaflet out while you're not seeing the other. So you may not be having an optimal view for both leaflets at the same time but focus on posterior versus anterior or septal versus anterior to kind of work through, through those side lobe artifacts. Uh, to get back to your question uh, about co-optation uh, and, and the malcoaptation or the gap, uh, better to call, um, I believe, again, uh, having an informed approach, meaning you have a 3D and then you derive a 2D image that informs you and then you can have good granularity. Sometimes I find if we go into multiplanar views, we're losing some of the uh, actual um, resolution, the spatial re resolution that is. So I find often if I, if I um, can use a biplane image, I'm better off having 2D imaging and then scroll through, make sure we get the point in time that we are interested in. And, and, and by the way, if we think about severity of TR, we always talk about torrential and we talk about uh, all these additional maybe grades. And I think it's good to put also numbers to it and quantify. And what we've learned from our own internal research is when you use 3D color in terms of to be informed when the biggest vena contractor may be coming about, we find that that happens in functional or secondary TR, mostly in the third first um, third of systole. So kind of in the early phase of systole is when often also you see your continuous wave Doppler if it's well aligned peak. And, and we found the biggest vena contractor areas then. So that's kind of the time point I also use for measuring out that malcoaptation or that gap and then uh, reconfirm it. Ideally you do it in two cutting planes and you kind of look at it from different views, better to say. Uh, to be redundant, um, but but that's my approach. Thank you, Burkhard. And that you're referring uh, when when using biplane, you're uh, obviously referring to the RV inflow outflow view with biplane to measure that gap between the septal and anterior or septal and posterior, depending on where you put the plane, as as Deepa was showing. And this is a good segue to uh, another question I have for you, and I, I want to get your opinion on. Um, as we start talking about what are candidates, uh, good candidates and potentially not good candidates for edge-to-edge -edge repair, and we start thinking about other devices such as annuloplasty or valve replacement, um, what are your thoughts on device leads and their influence on tricuspid vegetation, which may or may not be uh, the culprit? Yeah, that's an excellent point and a huge challenge in this space, uh, unquestionably. Um, and I think of it similar to when 
Tava came about and the Tava technology was developed. If you look at all the big trials at first, they excluded bicuspid aortic valves. And now we see bicuspid aortic valves uh, on a regular basis coming for Tava. Um, I'm not saying it's going to be the same with these patients with their leads, uh, but it is a little bit like that when you look at the clinical trials we're likely not going to get much information from the clinical trials because these patients are excluded when they have their leads in place. And yet in clinical practice, these patients come with their end-stage uh, severe tricuspid regurgitation and have no alternative to go to. So I, I do think as a community, we, we have to address this topic. And we can be, uh, especially as the te technology for either... Um, the you know, clasp or the clip even develops further, we have perhaps more of a toolkit, more of an opportunity to cater to the need and be strategic about where we start. And that's, again, the role of the imager can be part of that strategy. How do you approach this scenario? Because we do see, can even measure the dynamics of a lead moving in and out and to what degree actually it leans on a leaflet and pushes that leaflet. And perhaps we cannot get it um, to be grasped in that very maximum impact and impingement point, but maybe we need to really work from afar and work from a commissure in order to later on get maybe to the other side of a lead and therefore fix the situation. Um, again, strategy is important, good communication about what we see. Is it a static lead or is it highly mobile? Um, certainly our responsibility as imager also is to steer the interventional cardiologist um, away from that lead as much as possible not to get entangled. And we've had scenarios where it got quite dicey. Um, I would say we have an obligation to even offer treatment to these patients and we should not uh, shy away and in, in, in trying to address them. So. Um, Experience is a key element in, in this one as well. And um, I would say, again, the centers that treat patients even outside of trials uh, on a large uh, basis uh, are probably the, the centers that uh, I would look to for additional information and learning opportunities. How do you confirm a uh, proper grasp of the leaflets? What is your strategy in order to confirm that you know, both leaflets are well inserted. Yeah, that's a more challenging question for the tricuspid uh, world than it is for the mitral, for sure. So it's a, I'm glad you bring it up. Uh, first off, I believe uh, the similar aspects that, that apply for the mitral space um, are important here as well. Are the leaflets immobilized or stabilized? Um, do we have an opportunity to potentially measure out the length of the leaflet ahead of time and then after the clip has been closed to ensure that there's enough leaflet length in there if we can if we have that resolution um, resolution by the way is another important topic especially if you want to have a derived 2d image from 3d try to push and play with spatial resolution as opposed to temporal resolution it often will help uh, to increase your spatial resolution for having more granular uh, measurements uh, like these. The next uh, aspect is look for indirect signs of both leaflets are being in, meaning do we have a reduction of TR? And while maybe there is situations where we start in the commissure, we're not expecting a whole lot of a change because it's a more strategic first clip and a second clip is hopefully where we're going to have an impact. Ideally, we do see a bit of an impact of reduction of tricuspid regurg uh, before we engage in, in perhaps releasing or deploying a clip. And then lastly, um, I demand time at times. Uh, you know, I'm saying, well, wait a moment, like, give me a moment. Uh, I have to look at this. And I want, what I mean with that is I need to have at least a couple of imaging planes to look at this and not just you know, based on a transgastric view, then maybe we use that to grasp, but I want to take a moment to go to a different height in the esophagus to get yet a different shot. And, and sometimes it's surprising, even, you know, we talked about biplane imaging, um, you know, sometimes you have to change the, the multiplane angle that you start with 
and then you get a resulting image that helps you on a sudden and you, you can't really predict that always um, what i'm saying here is sometimes getting at an image with just a 2d approach may not be sufficient you may not have the ability to kind of sweep through the multiplane angle and the cutting plane and we again we have to think about one element that we're trying to cut perfectly and see the leaflets it's so good to have that sweeping ability with biplane imaging but change your angles and all of a sudden you'll have an image that oh yeah that that actually convinces me and it's definitely great advice and you know, I actually would love to get, Enrique, your opinion on you know, what are some of the ways that you determine success, you know, after an edge-to-edge -edge repair? What are some of the things that you look for? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I would love to hear Burkhardt's opinion as well, because it is one of those 360-degree assessments where you look at everything. You look at uh, the position of the device. Is it optimal? The orientation of the arms in regards to the to the leaflets, to the, to the co-optation, the amount of leaflet insertion, the adequacy of the grasp, and the residual uh, tricuspid vegetation. And, you know, as you may move on to a second or a third device, you also start looking at uh, transvalvular gradients, for example, which we typically don't worry that much about the tricuspid gradient in native uh, valve disease, but in this case, you have to start taking that into consideration. Uh, it is, I, I think it's a little bit of an unanswered question to this day. Uh, it, it's pretty clear from talking to different people, uh, experts, that we are not looking for mild tricuspid vegetation necessarily. But what is that, what is that number for each individual patient is something that we, we take on a case by case. I don't know, what, what are your thoughts on that, Burkhardt? Yeah, challenging, more challenging again on the tricuspid than on the mitral where there's simply more work done. And, uh, you know, you and I had some opportunity to, to look at more recent um, G4 technology and, uh, and look at uh, how difficult it is at times to really grade the post mitral regurgitation um, severity and similar for the tricuspid valve. Um, often I find that on the tricuspid, we have even more little jets to deal with. So we're dispersing uh, the initial regurgitation into several jets. And sometimes I find it more challenging than to use 3D, which I really use routinely on the mitral side to look at the remaining uh, vena contractor area and, and use that as a quantifying element and saying enough is enough and we've achieved what we, what we came here for. On the tricuspid, a little bit more challenging. Sometimes these are small jets and it's hard to summation or find a summation opportunity. Um, the, the, the few key elements that we look at is a bit of a percent reduction from baselines. So if we can quantify using vena contractor area, we like that as a, a reliable method to kind of look at baseline and then uh, look again after intervention. Keeping in mind that these patients will often benefit even if we're not perfect yet in terms of treating the TR. And there is an opportunity if they don't live too far away to potentially bring them back for more of an additional edge-to-edge -edge repair. I think that's an important piece to keep in mind that, that you don't necessarily, like in surgery, you have to do everything you can because you don't want to ever come back because you have that stenotomy again here. Maybe there's an opportunity to come back and, and, and improve upon something that, that was started and maybe have some better action of diuretics and therefore bring the leaflets closer together next time around when you, when you bring the patient back potentially. And then lastly, hepatic venous flow, similar to the pulmonary venous flow patterns that we look at from mitral. I think it's really a good art. It's not easy. I, I find it challenging at times with the transesophageal echo to have good alignment without an angle deviation to get a convincing signal at baseline and then repeat that at, at a later point. But it's good to go to the same vein and have the same angle of interrogation to not look at um, different, different uh, measurements. And then finally, there's, there's another piece that, that I find fascinating is if you look at cardiac output, 
And uh, you can do that directly or indirectly. You can look at pulmonary venous flow on the mitral side and see if the velocities there will actually change. And if the ventricle is up for it, the right ventricle that is, you may actually see a bit of an uptake, uptake in, um, in the cardiac output. And you may see velocities on the left side actually improve, assuming that, that there's not severe MR, which hopefully has been treated before if it's, if it's present. You know, that was my actually my next exact question. Um, if you measure RV stroke volume at all, you know, pre and post, if, if that's something that has ever been looked at or if that's something that you look at, um, is that something that either um, person on the panel looks at, you know, RV stroke volume before and after tricuspid valve interventions? Yeah, I can start and uh, happy for Enrique to chime in. Um, it's only more recent that we've actually started to have it on card as an opportunity, as opposed to, in retrospect, look at a, let's say, a three-dimensional mo model. Um, I believe that, that a real good assessment of RV stroke volume can, can be had if you, if you have um, a good 3D model to work with and then you know, assess end diastolic and end systolic volumes that way. Uh, there's obviously alternative methods, but, but I think they don't give the complex shape of the RV justice. Uh, so that's something that, that could really be done now that that technology is more available. Uh, I'm not aware of anyone having really looked at RV uh, stroke volumes pre and post uh, tricuspid um, clip intervention, for instance. And by the way, I just uh, thought about the registry. Uh, we saw about three to 400 patients in there. Um, the triluminate trial alone, uh, just FYI, has more than 360 patients enrolled as well. And I don't think they are in that registry. So uh, as we speak, there's more and more data that we will be able to look at um, outside of even the registry. Ricard, and there's a, another question from Dr. Bellani here. Uh, about the degradation of the quality of data sets when you're trying to utilize uh, live 3D NPR for grasping, for example. And, and of course, you have, to, you have to know in what type of patients you're going to do that. There are situations where you simply cannot use 3D derived NPRs for, for, uh, for very fine measurements or fine uh, parts of the procedure. How often do you, uh, do you use 3D NPR for the grasping view? Yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting point. Um, and I'm not entirely sure yet what technically makes some of these 2D images, derived 2D images in a multiplanar view um, degrade uh, to the point that they do. Uh, but I'm, I'm very quick in acknowledging when that happens. And then I mostly try to turn to biplane imaging again with the views that we discussed. And if that's not a possibility, and if I'm struggling, then I'll say, just give me a moment, I change my multiplane angle, and I go to exactly a dedicated, I call it a dedicated view then, and use that. And I have no, no qualms in doing that on the mitral side as well. If, if sometimes it's just, uh, if it's more in the commissure, or if it's more challenging to see the posterior aspect on the mitral valve, then I may go to a long axis view to, to have more dedication to, to that image and, and then be able to maybe zo use a zoom function or uh, something of that nature to bring up the image and, and closer. Uh, resolution certainly improves from that as well. And uh, I think it's something that uh, I can only hope that the technology will get better over time with multiplane imaging that's derived from 3D. Thank you so much. So we've talked a lot about the edge-to-edge -edge repair, which is obviously the most uh, evolved, uh, you know, and CE mark now uh, uh, technology. But what about uh, valve replacement? What's your experience with that? And what is the, what would be the optimal candidate uh, for tricuspid, percutaneous tricuspid valve replacement that perhaps is not a good candidate for edge-to-edge -edge repair in your practice? Yeah, challenge there is the size of the annulus and then what time point does the patient present for therapy and where's your institution in terms of being involved in a, in a trial and, and having opportunity to enroll uh, before these valves become FDA approved or, or similar to that. 
So I'd say the challenge is the annual dimensions and what these companies are preparing for. Uh, then the calcific changes that we see on the mitral are not as relevant on the tricuspid. Um, the leads are certainly a, a point of contention and a, and a problem, especially if they're not tucked away, right, a priori in the commissure, and if they seem to be uh, pretty dominantly in the, in the center of the valve is, is a challenge. Um, and then lastly, um, I think, again, um, the impact on the conduction system will continue to be something that uh, we will learn more about. Um, and, and we'll have to have our patients live with some of the consequences um, of, of that and be as mindful as possible. Again, that's where imaging, I think, can play a role in rotating the valve uh, with sparing the conduction system as much as possible, uh, hopefully also in future iterations of these valves. Personally, I have not been involved in any um, deployment of the more, more recent developed uh, valves. Uh, because we have not enrolled patients here. Uh, the biggest uh, experience I have is on the tricuspid valve and valve or valve and ring side of things. Uh, but then you, you're dealing with already having a bit of a platform. So that's a different scenario. And, you know, just a, a quick last question, because I know we're running um, a little bit over, but I think it's an important question. I would love to hear what your thoughts are on future echo technology like ice catheters and where you see their role to be in the in the tricuspid valve space. I'm glad you bring that up. That's a, gonna be a challenge for all of us. Um, first of all, a challenge in an opportunity that, that will hopefully be more than complementary to what we do currently and help us in these frustrate, frustrating uh, scenarios that we discussed, uh, some of them. Uh, to have yet an, an alternative to image. Um, I've seen so far um, several iterations of these catheters and uh, limited ability to date uh, in the clinical space to be a reliable improvement above and beyond what I can uh, see or can do often with the TE probe. Uh, that said, as that technology gets better and if I can envision a multiplane um, opportunity on an ice catheter that is placed safely, and then someone uh, who knows how to work an echo machine and can bring out the best alignment and bring out the best utility with the multiplane or biplane imaging, then I can see it potentially uh, happening. Again, I think it's, it's on us um, to be as involved as possible in that space as it happens. Um, I, I would think that even though some interventional cardiologists may, may wish to be on their own and more independent in that, I would, I would be fearing that the patients would be losing out in that some of the competency and some of the extreme dedicated knowledge of an interventional image guidance person uh, would, would no longer be in the room. And that could be quite a loss. So I think it's on us to be actively involved in that and find solution that either from the groin or from maybe from the head of the patient, we can actually still work the uh, echo platform. And I can see even of an access point from the IJ as opposed to the uh, you know, femoral vein uh, for that ice catheter. But again, the technology um, will improve, there's no question. Uh, but what we see currently is not quite at the point that I, I would say it's reliably uh, the first to go technology. Yeah, I'm excited to see where that where it will lead us. And um, with that, I wanted to thank you all for being part of um, this great lecture and discussion. I think it was excellent. And that concludes our mini lecture series in Structural Heart. Um, I wanted to thank um, all members of the panel today for, for joining us and all of our uh, attendees. Our next uh, lecture is going to be on September 20th on contrast echocardiography. And I hope you all will join us at that time. Thank you again and have a great night.